Hey everyone, I'm Kate Friedman, and I'm so excited to be here with you. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I am a neurodivergent, non-binary, queer educator. Um, I have taught literacy courses at NYU, and I consult pretty much all over the world um, on how to make classrooms more inclusive, particularly when we think about disabled kids and gender non-conforming kids. Um, and I feel like this topic of like how we make writing accessible is often overlooked. We often think about like, when we say literacy, people often think reading, um, and that's important, but writing is also super important. So I'm excited to share some of this with you. I also want to name that when I accepted this presentation, I, I was thinking about um, teaching teachers the foundations of the English language because of this national crisis we're in the middle of right now where so many states and schools are using curriculum that is not teaching structured literacy and how all of our students are, are missing out. Um, but now that there is a shift towards that, and now that hopefully most of you are using curriculum that is based in phonics um, and Orton-Gillingham, you are starting to learn more about the structure of literacy and also um, how to teach it. And so I thought I would focus a little bit less on that and a little bit more on how do we make writing accessible. So I'm going to share my screen and I have a lot of exciting tools to share with you today. Okay, so this is the talk. Um, I'm going to talk to you about universal design and differentiation. I'm going to talk about why we write, how do we prepare students to write, what does a writing conference look like, um, how do we foster self-monitoring and interdependence, um, what does student sharing look like? And I use the fire emoji because we want like to uplift kids and make their work fire. Um, how, do, how does homework look if we are thinking about accessible writing? Um, and also like a little bit at the end about like how you can sort of shore up your foundational skills in the English language. So I'm gonna start with why we write because I think we often overlook this, right? We often jump right in to mechanics. And I think stepping back and thinking about the why is so important. Um, this is Pam Allen. She's a literacy expert and a children's rights activist. And she says, reading is like breathing in and writing is like breathing out. And storytelling is what links both. It is the soul of literacy. The most powerful tool that we have to strengthen literacy is often the most underused and overlooked. And that is a child's own stories. And so I wanna just like center us in yes, we want to make writing accessible. And a big piece of that is involving kids' lives. And how do we connect whatever we're supposed to be teaching because of our curriculum and because of state standards to the relevance of, of a kid's life, their own lived experiences. And as if we're often centering that, um, that's kind of the first step in making writing accessible, even though I know we're talking about accessibility in terms of um, disability more so right now. Um, I often like to say that we write because we want to change the world. We want to create the world that we want to live in. And so I encourage you to think about whatever your writing activities are um, in your curriculum. And if they're not geared towards kids sharing and expressing their own lives or using writing as, a, as, a, as an action, to make the world a better place, um, please do that. Um, that's, that's, for me, that's the purpose of writing. Um, it's both to share our stories and to, to help create the world that we want, right? What is the documentation that we're leaving? Um, and I think this framing, this conversation I'm having with you right now is super important to have with kids at all ages, um, just to sort of ground the work um, and to help us as teachers stay connected to um, the purpose of our, of what we're asking kids to do. So I want to dive a little bit into UDL and differentiation because this is what frames all of my work um, as an inclusion expert and an accessibility expert. Um, UDL is universal design for learning. It is the framework for thinking about teaching as the way we think about universal design and architecture, right? So like the classic example is we think about a ramp um, in front of a building or a curb cut and how, yes, that is like exactly meant to support wheelchair users, but it's also for people carrying packages on a dolly, right? Or someone pushing a stroller or someone on rollerblades or roller skates or a, 
a skateboard. And so that same kind of like expanding how we think about teaching to include as many kids as possible um, is universal design for learning. And there's three major components that I'm gonna teach you about in a minute. Um, but really the overarching thing that I want you to get from this is that it's connected to differentiation. And the more that you employ these practices in your lesson planning, the less on the spot changes you will have to make. Um, and as a teacher, like I often think about like minimal preparation. And so this is like, I am doing a little bit more prep in, for UDL in order to, in the moment, be able to like be with my students um, because I'm not having to make as many like on the fly accommodations or modifications. So UDL in writing, these are the three principles. There's multiple means of representation. And I often think about this as like your mini lesson or right after. Um, and it's sharing content in more than one way. So if you're teaching a writing lesson, you want to model it. You want to show student examples. You want to have anchor charts. You want to have mini checklists that mirror your anchor charts, right? Mini checklists that kids can bring back to their desk or wherever they're writing, where they see all the things they just learned um, and can sort of like track it. The next principle is multiple means of action and expression. This is the like you do part of a lesson um, when we think of like the workshop model and it's offering students choice about how to use their new learning. And I think we often get caught up on what this choice can look like. So I wanted to give you some really good examples. The first choice is like the kids wanna work alone in a small group or they wanna sit at the table with the rest of the class. Like, like that's a really important choice to think about and to frame it for kids as, what would help you write best, right? Not like what would you, what would make you happy socially, but like what would help you be focused in writing? Um, we can also offer different kinds of templates for brainstorming and sketching out ideas, right? Different kinds of graphic organizers. This is, this is giving students choice um, and saying like, pick one. You don't have to use them, you can use them. Um, and, and not having it be teacher directed, but having it be like a presented to the class and then you pick what's right for you. Um, same thing with paper choices, right? I'm all about paper choices. I used to have really big stacks of many different kinds of paper in my classroom so that kids could just go take the paper that felt right. Um, and it doesn't have to be like thinking about levels, right? And like what kid is ready for like more writing and less drawing. Um, it can also just be like, I'm having a tough day and I feel like drawing more of my story. Um, I'm like, I encourage you to keep that kind of thinking even in like high school years. Another way that we can think about how kids are expressing themselves, the you do part, is like how their words are recorded. Um, and I don't think we talk about this enough either. Like are kids handwriting? Are they typing? Are they talking and it's being you know, transcribed by someone? Are they doing speech to text on a digital device? Um, these are also choices that we can offer everyone, right? There might be a few kids in our class who are mandated as an assistive technology to use speech to text. But if we have computers, let's offer that to everyone. The last part of UDL, and this is kind of like the big big umbrella part, is the how are we engaging kids? Um, and it's really not just like a moment, it's the whole lesson. Are we including students' interests and stories and lives? Are we creating structure to help them get through it emotionally, right? Are there scaffolds and agendas and checklists so that it doesn't feel so daunting and help have them like shut down and disengage? And also like, are we remembering that they're kids? Are we giving them movement breaks? Are we playing chill instrumental music in the background to support their writing? Are we giving them social time to like talk to someone about their ideas and like, you know, process them before going back to quiet writing? So here's an example. This is a lower elementary example of UDL in action. Um, I was teaching a geography lesson and the students were like super done writing and I wanted to think of a creative way to help them write. So I turned our classroom into an airport. Um, this was a, like a simulation of my smart board where I had YouTube videos of planes taking off and landing. And we gave students passports and we put all the desks separated out around the room. And I enlisted teachers and parents and um, service providers to come each be the like travel agent for a country. And kids would take their passports and go to different countries around the room and write in their passports what they were learning. And they would have to ask questions to the travel agent person about, you know, what are the foods they eat in Italy? Or what are some of the songs they sing in Ireland, right? 
Um, and it was really, I focused it on the countries of origin of my students, which I think was also like a meaningful way for them to go both learn more about their home cultures and also learn about each other's um, ancestral cultures. But kids didn't even know they were writing. I mean, they didn't even realize it. They, no one said like, oh, okay, no more writing. They were just like, oh, I'm going to the next country. Let me write my passport. Here's another example. And this was an upper elementary. It actually might've been a, a, a beginning middle school class where they were doing family history presentations. Um, and this was also part of a social studies unit of understanding where you come from, your place in the world, your family's history. Um, and so kids had choices in how they wanted to gather information some kids were calling up like grandma on the phone and then pressing record on a you know, device to, to record the whole conversation. Some kids did Zoom. Some kids just like went to grandma's house and sat on the couch and took notes, um, right? And so that's like a way of like giving them some options and choice. And then also in how they presented to the class, some kids recorded themselves either talking or doing a presentation. Some kids did live presentations. Some kids made like a book about their family history that they then shared with the class. Some kids did PowerPoints. Um, and so this is like, we were still all getting at the goal of learning about your family history while embedding ELA skills. So differentiation is connected to this because differentiation is also about choice, but it's about specifically thinking about choice in terms of your group of students and what they would benefit from. So you're not just thinking about like random ideas, you're thinking like, okay, I have some kids who really need structure. I'm gonna make sure that I have like three different kinds of papers um, and each one has different levels of structure or different structure features um, that they can choose from, right? Um, and again, you're not offering this to just the kids who like have IEGs. Differentiation is tier one. Right? It means that everyone is getting some options. And so there's four areas of differentiation. The first one is content, the what. Um, and I, I sometimes think about this in terms of quantity, right? Like in writing, maybe some kids are writing one sentence, some are writing three, and some are writing a paragraph. When I think about like reading for differentiation, maybe everyone's reading the same book, but at different levels. Or maybe everyone's reading like Goldilocks, but different versions from around the world. Um, that's the content. The next part is the how, the process. And this is where I often think about paper choice um, in writing. And here's three options, right? One is most of your page is a drawing with a little bit of room to write something. Half your page is a drawing and half has room for writing. Or the whole page is just ready to go for writing and you don't even want to draw. Um, and maybe you also have sentence starters. Maybe you have them like on like stickers on labels that you've printed out so that if kids need them, they can grab a sentence starter, plop it on their page and be ready to go. The next area of differentiation is the product, right? This is the choice of like how kids are gonna show you what they know. And so here are three examples. One is letter writing. And the letter writing of course is on paper that I have boxed out so that kids know where parts go because sometimes that can be confusing. Um, another option could be writing a comic with dialogue. Another comic, another option could be doing a book review. Um, and if like the thing that you're checking to see is if kids can write sentences, you can see this in all of them. The last thing to think about, and this is the part that's sort of separate from your lesson, but is connected, is the learning environment. And we always want to think about how we're going to differentiate the learning environment to support all of the kids in the room. Um, and I want to just note space and sound is really important. I often used to have conversations with students about the room and like, what do you notice? Oh, it's noisier by the door. It's quieter by the windows, but not where the radiator is. When it's winter, the radiators make lots of noise. Um, you know, kids would notice like if I'm facing other kids, it's harder for me to concentrate. If I'm facing the wall, it's easier. And we would have really serious conversations about this. So when it was time to write, I would say, pick the space in the room that is gonna support you to write? Do you need to be standing? Do you need to be at a desk, sitting at a desk? Do you wanna be laying on the floor with like a little um, plastic desk? Do you need to be near the radiator? Cause the hissing sort of is like white noise and helps. Um, and to really have kids be critical and think reflectively about what would help them as writers. So I'm gonna show you later a lot more examples of how to differentiate differentiate content and process. 
Um, I want to give you some ideas now about how to differentiate products and learning environment because I feel like sometimes those are the hardest to think of. So the ways that you can differentiate products in writing is to turn a writing lesson into creating a puppet show and writing out a script or writing letters, right? I'm writing letters thinking about changing the world, right? Who can we write a letter to to make a change that would benefit the most people? Maybe it's writing a letter to the principal. Maybe it's writing a letter to the families, to, to all the kids, parents, and caregivers. Um, maybe it's writing to a state senator, a congressman, congressperson. It could be developing a class mural and using tons of labels, right? And maybe the labels are color-coded if it's like a noun or a verb. Changing the lyrics to a song. This was one of my students' favorite things to do. And then I would write the new song on chart paper so that it became like a, 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 pra, a literacy practice that was fun and kids would voluntarily go read the song lyrics and sing along to it, not realizing that they were also doing reading and writing. Delivering a TV news segment. I had a class one year that also all they wanted to do was perform. And so every week we put on a TV news segment and I filmed it and sent it home to families. And kids had different jobs, kids made cue cards, kids wrote out the script, kids wrote out the narration, kids wrote out the like anchor position versus like the weather person and the game review person. Um, and it was a way to embed all the things that we were learning in reading and writing and listening and speaking, which we also, also often forget about our skills deeply connected to reading and writing and for younger kids are prerequisites writing a newspaper blog or magazine article, drawing a comic strip with dialogue and story features, right? Like the, the next day um, or a one month later, that kind of stuff. Writing a screenplay, and I'm sure you're imagining many, many, many more ideas. Um, but hopefully this will get you started in thinking about if you have curriculum where all of your lessons are about like essay writing, maybe some of them can be changed, right? There's only so many essays someone can write, can write before they either understand how to write an essay or not. And continuing to write only in one form doesn't necessarily make you stronger, right? Having opportunities to write in a variety of forms and then take those skills back um, is often really powerful. So there's lots of different, different ways to differentiate the learning environment. Here are some specific ones that I think about when I think about writing. Um, having a spacing tool, this is a space Martian, um, and this is, you know, mostly for younger kids, but maybe not, depending on the um, disabilities of your students or, um, yeah, if they're new to English, there's lot, lots of different reasons. Different kinds of pencil grips for both purchased ones and on the right, you can just take rubber bands, wrap them around the bottom of a pencil, and you have a homemade pencil grip. Having sand timers, and this is particularly helpful for kids who like get stuck or need a little encouragement. You could say, here's a two minute sand timer, write for two minutes and then come get me. Um, or here's a five minute sand timer, draw as much as you can about your story in five minutes. And then when it's over, switch to writing. Um, lots of ways to sort of give kids more control and regulate. I always think about fidgets. I love fidgets. I have two right here with me. I also, sometimes when I'm writing, I write with my right hand, I'll fidget in my left hand and that's really helpful. And so that's also just something to keep in mind, right? Like you might not have considered all the ways that kids use fidgets. And so having it as an option during writing um, can be helpful. Noise canceling headphones were gold when I was a classroom teacher. So many kids use them, particularly during writing to just like get in their head and be focused. Desk dividers and like there's one, this is one that you could purchase, but I made them out of cardboard boxes and I used packing tape and stuff and it was totally fine. Um, I packing taped the whole inside so that it was like a dry erase board and also so kids could like tape checklists to it um, and they wouldn't like rip the paper afterwards. Chair bands are super often overlooked. They're giant rubber bands that go around the front two legs of a chair that give you physical input while you're sitting. And for kids who are fidgety or wiggly, um, or who like to move around a lot and like can't do that while they're writing, um, this can be a helpful tool. And then I also think about flexible seating and standing. And I know a lot of people don't have the budgets or the administrative support to buy flexible seating for their classroom. Um, and so I think like, 
taking a table, raising the legs and making it a standing desk. And that's just something kids can go to can be really helpful. Um, there's also like, you can take a cardboard box and wrap it and have that be like a footrest for kids whose feet don't hit the floor. There are free ways to sort of create flexible seating and support kids in the classroom um, without having to like buy fancy things. Okay, we're gonna move into preparing students to write and there's so many parts to this. Um, the first is when you're reading books or texts that include the text features and structures you're gonna be teaching and writing, you gotta name them. Um, even if it hasn't happened yet, but especially if it already has, like the more opportunities that you can give students uh, connections to different ways that they have seen or used text features will translate to their writing. Um, it's a way to make writing more accessible because not all kids are making those connections automatically when they see them. Documenting is also super important, and I think we don't talk about this enough, that whatever format you're asking kids to write in, you have to make sure you've taught those skills in a low-pressure, interest-based way. So if kids are handwriting, let them handwrite all the names of their people they love. Um, if you're doing speech-to-text, have kids practice with the software telling their stories of their dreams, right? Um, if someone's gonna dictate, if a kid is gonna dictate and another adult or someone is going to transcribe what they're writing, practice that so that kids can hold stuff in their head because a, someone's not gonna write as fast as they're talking um, the way that like speech to text is kind of automatic. And if kids are typing also, give them lots and lots of practice to type before you ask them to like sit down and, and type out a story. Generating ideas is also something that there's a lot more creative ways to do this now that I think we forget about. And so I'm just gonna show you a few of my favorites. Um, the idea web is classic, right? And this is a scholastic example, but you could also like teach kids how to make these on their own and use shapes that matter to them. Um, you can give them shape stencils and they can code a different shape, you know, is a main idea versus, you know, maybe a heart is a main idea, but a square is a detail. and you know, kids can make these on their own and you can model it, right? You can think of a class story. Maybe you went on a class trip and you come back and you have your chart paper up or your, you know, um, your whiteboard. You can practice writing out all of their ideas and then even afterwards going back and putting a shape around them to code them um, or going back after and numbering them, right? To help kids think about the sequence once they've um, generated lots of ideas. I'm also super into vision boards and like mood boards. I use these all the time. Um, I ask students and their families in the summer to make them about them, who they are and their culture and their language and who they live with and what they love to do. So that when we come into class, the first week of school every year, we have like all of this and I print them out, beautiful visual representation of who is in the room. What are they bringing? What are their lived experiences? And we can also do this for generating ideas. Um, kids are really good at this, especially on slides. You can go to insert image from web and it'll pop up right on the side of the slide, a little Google image browser. And so you can literally type in the things that you are thinking about, the ideas you have, and they insert right into the slide. And if each kid made a slide, you'd have like this amazing idea board for every unit, right? Another thing that I really like to do is I like to write on post-its and then order them. And so I often did this with kids, right? I would give each kid three post-its. I would say, write down your ideas, put them in the order that makes sense in terms of beginning, middle, end, and then put them right over where you're writing so that they're right there ahead of, in front of you whenever you're writing. Um, and if you like had to leave the room, you could take them with you. It was like portable, right? Um, and kids could like cross things off on them or circle something and arrow it to a different post-it. And it was like, a, it was very low pressure. Sometimes like an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper feels very formal for kids um, and post-its just feel, they're disposable, right? They're just like, they're a much more um, accessible tool in many ways. So I teach graduate classes at NYU and one of my students just introduced me to this and I think it's just perfect. It's called milling to music. Um, and it's this idea that like when you're generating ideas to write, you walk around the room to slow instrumental music. And when the teacher pauses the music, they ask a question and whoever you're nearest to, you sort of 
do a little turn and talk with, right? And so it could be, think of one idea for a letter for someone you might want to write a letter to, right? And so kids are like walking around, they're feeling music, they're getting ideas, they stop, they try an idea out by talking to someone, they keep moving. And it could be three or four minutes, and maybe you stop five or six times, maybe you stop 10 times. But this way, all the ideas have sort of already sort of been processed and kids have like talked about it, right? Often talking about it can help. And so when they sit down at the table to write, it's not just like nothing. They've already done some of the like pre-work. Um, I'm gonna show you a small clip of this video. The Millington Music Activity is a great one for brainstorming. It allows students that time to think about the subject, their own background knowledge, it allows them to have a personal opinion. And when we've been able to talk out the ideas in advance, when they set to writing, they're not staring at a blank page. They already have those ideas in their head. I wanna name also, if you go back to watch this video, um, she calls it like being fancy. And I feel like that's really, uh, I mean, it's like, it's saying that, going to fancy parties is something kids should want to uh, strive for, and particularly like the ways that white wealthy people make family fancy parties, and uh, I struggle with that. So I don't usually show the beginning of this video. It's for you to decide. So my friend and colleague, Erin Lanou has made these incredible graphic organizers that sort of reinvent the ones that you've thought of. Um, and I've given you a link to a folder with all of them, along with like instructions, because they're transparent and you can put them on different things. Um, but one of my favorites is this double bubble instead of a Venn diagram. And it's the idea that there's gonna be many ways that some of the topics that you're comparing overlap and having just that tiny little intersection of two circles when you do a Venn diagram isn't really enough. And so here's a way to think about three different ways that your topics connect and then four different ways that they differ. Um, I call them the next level graphic organizers. Um, and I think it's really great if you use these in your mini lessons, maybe there's a few of them that speak to you, and then you have a stack of them in the classroom ready to go so that whenever kids wanna use them, they can, right? Maybe it's for a personal reason. Maybe it's for a TV show and comparing two characters they love, like who knows, but, Part of what's making writing accessible is using tools yourself and then having a lot of opportunities for kids to practice and giving them the option to choose when they want to practice. I also can't speak highly enough of visual vocabulary charts. Oftentimes we get kids ready to sit down and write and the topic they're writing about has so many hard to spell words that they haven't learned yet and kids get really hung up on the spelling and super frustrated and it sort of stops the ability to get the ideas out. So if you know a topic that a kid is about to write about and has really you know, big words and difficult vocabulary, just give them the spelling of all of those things. Um, and it's, it's faster also than like um, using a dictionary or a picture dictionary. So here's an example of musical instruments. Um, here's another one that a student of mine made of all the elements that were in a story they read that kids were about to write about with the language of the things in the story, both in English and Spanish to support their multilingual learners. I wanna pause for a second and also say, there's a lot of different ways to talk about kids who are learning English, um, right? English is a new language, English language learner, um, but all of those sort of prioritize English and center it as the most important because you're, if English is the first word in those uh, acronyms. And so multilingual learner is actually a much more accessible and inclusive term because it's acknowledging and sort of equalizing all the languages that a kid speaks. Um, and so I just want to put that out there, MLL, multilingual learner. This was a class I taught like 15 years ago. So these kids are in college and it's totally okay. I blocked out their names, but this was a, a student chart that I made that sat on every table in the classroom and it was double-sided and it was in like a lucite, you know, a clear plastic frame. And this way, whenever kids wanted to write a note to someone or include someone in a story, everyone's names were right there. 
It also helped with some spelling and pattern recognition because they would notice it in each other's names more so, I think, than when I just had names like on the word wall, right? Okay, let's talk about writing conferences um, where you know, you're know you going around, you're checking in on kids and you're giving them a little bit of support. The first thing that's really important to make these accessible is to really teach about feedback before you need to use it, right? And you wanna co-construct feedback opportunities for everyone in the class, right? So here's an example of what I might say. Sometimes I will need to give you feedback so you can learn more. When I give you feedback, it will be on things you've done well and one thing to work on. I will show you how to do it and we'll practice it together. Then you can try on your own. How does that feel? I'm like, this is, you know, this is somewhat rehearsed for me, but um, it's a really important conversation to have. Kids will share with you exactly what they need, right? Like what is the best way to receive feedback? Some kids really like when you write them a little note and they can just like look at it and put it in the places where they need it. Some kids really wanna talk about it. Some kids are totally cool if you talk about it in front of other people and in the moment. Some kids really want you to talk about it later in the day and private and not have anyone else here. And so, um, again, kind of like thinking about the, the how we handwrite or type or do speech to text, um, how we document, also thinking about feedback and checking in with kids about how they wanna receive feedback is so important. Um, this is sort of my standard, how I give feedback. Um, I acknowledge something positive or, you know, explain that what I noticed. And then um, I really don't like to say I like or I love. It's not about me. I want to help the person self-reflect. So I, you know, I noticed that you use really big words in your sentences and check in the dictionary to see if they were spelled correctly, right? You're, you're like, objectively offering back what you what you see this person has done, right? And then you check in and say, what did you notice? <laughs> what do you think you did well? What do you think was hard? Um, and then just sharing one, I mean, I said one or two, but with kids, I would say one, I wrote this out for, for teachers, for adults, one thing that kids could work on. Um, and I often make them a little post-it using an example from their, from their writing with exactly how to, um, one goal of something that they they know that I noticed, maybe they noticed it too, that would make their writing stronger, right? Um, and this is also super helpful. And then I used to have in kids' writing folders, um, I had a piece of cardstock on the front in the front of it that had their goals, and so there's only one or two goals ever on there. And then on the back in the, the back pocket um, was another piece of cardstock that said all the things I know how to do now. And every time kids like, you know, master a goal, they got to like move that post-it. And that was also a way I knew when I sat down to conference with kids, what I should bring up. It was also a way that I knew how to group kids when I wanted to do small group lessons, right? Like if I made five post-its that went in one day about adding details, that's probably a small group instruction, maybe even another whole group mini lesson. Um, and so even just the act of focusing on one thing per kid helped me sort of think about the whole class and what they needed. Here's Erin Lanou again, uh, my friend and colleague who invented Dynamicons. And I'm gonna show you these because I think they're so cool and they often help um, when you're writing little post-its for kids, right? One is teaching kids that when you have dots that it's called making a list, they're not necessarily in order. Um, however, when you have boxes, you're checking things off, that's a how-to, that's an order. That's like instructions. Um, the progress bar is maybe my favorite and I use this even for myself. I will just draw a little progress bar at the bottom of whatever I'm working on and break it into the different parts. And every time I finish a part, I color in the part of the progress bar. And by the end I have finished and the progress bar is complete and it's very satisfying. Kids also love this. And it's a way to help them think about chunking an activity down into smaller parts so that they can see that they are accomplishing and moving forward. The last one, which is so specific to writing is brackets that can show how much to write. Sometimes kids get really stuck and feel like, how many lines should my introduction be? And even though there's not a perfect science to it, just bracketing it off and showing them, right? That like the introduction is really small, the main body, um, the biggest part is your body, your, you know, your topic sentences and details and paragraphs and the bottom is a small conclusion. Even just that little bit of framing can be so helpful. 
um, and really ease the anxiety. This is my last tip, um, and it's called the single point rubric, um, and you can use it when you're conferencing with students. And it takes all the things that you have taught and lets kids think about what they did well and what they need to work on. And so instead of comparing themselves to everyone else in the class, they're instead thinking about just themselves and where they've improved and where they need to work, work on. Um, and it's really simple and it takes the attention off of grades and it helps you think about learning. It helps me as a teacher think exactly what my next goals are gonna be to support that child. And is another tool for helping me think about what small groups I want, want, might wanna make if lots of kids have the same kinds of things to, to work on. Okay, we're gonna move into kids monitoring themselves um, and the all important interdependence. You know, we often talk about independence, but we live in an interdependent world. And there are many things we do on our own, but we really can't live on our own. We all live in community and support each other. And so um, I just wanna highlight that yes, kids are self-monitoring and that is an independent activity, but we also wanna foster and um, give kids opportunities to use social skills um, to support each other when self-monitoring. So here's an example of a, um, this is Mrs. Winter's Bliss, this is her teacher page, um, of an anchor chart that sort of goes over the specific skills kids are working on and uses both color, simple color, and um, clear illustrations to give an example of how to use these different um, writing tools. And then taking that same anchor chart exactly how it looks and remaking it really small where you can cut them out and then every kid can have an example, a copy of it. Um, and that now is a checklist where you go through and you check off, right, it's in order. And it's also, um, it's really like, kids need to use less memory and like executive function, function skills if you're giving them the exact same thing that you just did as a big group that's all the way on the overside of the room, even though it's a big anchor chart and giving them their own version that they can write on and that's right there in front of them, right? Like just like the post-its, like right above your paper. Um, it can be really powerful. And here's an example of a differentiated one. This is from Amy Gunther's Teachers Pay Teacher page um, where she has the same exact kinds of um, things to look for on the left side, it is way less text and an image. And on the right side, it's much more text and even more things to look for, right? And so this is an example of differentiated writing checklists where you make this once and then you just have two checklists and kids pick the one that they need. Um, and I wanna really like emphasize that it is really important to let kids choose what they need mm -hmm. and not to mm -hmm. assume that kids are gonna pick the easier thing or do the same thing all the time. Like have faith in kids that they wanna learn mm -hmm. and grow and also, if a kid is picking the same thing over and over and you really strongly feel like they could um, do something a little bit more challenging, that's a great, that's great information for you to have. It tells you that like, maybe that kid is tired or maybe um, they're hungry or maybe they're exhausted. That's the same as tired. Um, but it gives you information to then sit and sit with the kid and say like, hey, I think you keep using the same checklist, but you're ready for a harder one. What do you think? Um, and so instead of it being top down, you're really, all your conversations are encouraging kids to think about what is, what is best for them and for them to decide it on their own, because in the end, we're not gonna be there, right? I also think it's super helpful. Another way to make writing super accessible is to chunk an activity down into parts and make it feel more manageable. Sometimes kids see in your mini lesson an end result and think, oh my goodness, there's no way I'm gonna be able to make that in one day. And so if you break it apart and say, look, we're gonna do this for three days. On the first day, I'm gonna show you a lot of examples. I'm gonna show you how to do this and we're gonna give you time to brainstorm. On the second day, you're gonna go back and look at your brainstorms. You're gonna pick one. And then, then from that, you're gonna make an idea web. On the third day, you're gonna go over your web. We're gonna do milling around. You're gonna to get to talk to other kids about it. And then you're gonna pick a way to start putting your ideas down. Um, like this is UDL and differentiation. I also used to really like having conversations with kids as, I, as a whole group where I would say, look, when do you get stuck? When we're writing, what is the hard part for you? 
Is it the beginning thinking of ideas? Is it the like when you make a mistake in the middle of writing? Is it the end when you just want to be done? Like what is the hard part for you? And like sometimes I use that to design small group supports and I would like say, okay, all the kids who struggle with getting your ideas started at the beginning, stay on the rug with me and we'll, we'll do that part together. And when you're ready, go back to go to your writing spots. Um, it also helped with my one-on-one -on -one conference goals, right? I would go over and I would see a kid had not sat there for the first five minutes doing nothing, but had used a, a graphic organizer to sort of jump in. And I'd be able to say, this was one of your goals. Your, one of your goals was to like, not just sit and feel stuck. And now you used a tool and moved ahead. And now this is a, you're ready for a new goal. Um, and so when I think about minimal teacher prep, I think about like systems that you can put in place that support kids, but also ensure that you're getting the data that you need, right? Sometimes we do assessments and that data, yeah, it's useful, but it's not like gonna support you in the moment with a kid on the day-to-day, -day, whereas this kind of data does. And then students can do checklists with peers or for peers. And I really love this. I think it's great. I used to tell kids they could do editing checklists on their own. They could do them sitting with a friend and then looking at each other's, or they could swap papers and do it for each other. Um, and that was really powerful. I think also sometimes we get so excited about what kids have made that we like want them to share. We want it to feel like fire, right? We want to like uplift kids and not everyone wants that. So I, you know, think about how they're going to share their work. Maybe it's making a video or an audio recording and then sharing it on a class website, right? Or one of your learning management systems. Um, I have a picture here of a kid with a superhero cape. I used to have a little superhero cape that kids could wear if they wanted to help feel really powerful when they presented their stories. And I would record them and send them home to families. Um, and it was really powerful, especially if you have parents or caregivers who like can't make it into school a lot because of their work schedule or kids who have parents that are separated and one lives really far away. Um, it's really a way to like bring the family in and give kids an opportunity to share what they're learning much further, much far, more far and wide. Um, sometimes I would say to kids, just highlight one piece of what you wrote that you wanna share, right? And you can like verbally tell us about it or you can just like highlight one part that you're super proud of um, if kids didn't wanna like share out, out loud. Um, and then I would also think about like, and ask kids, do you want to share all together? Do you want to sit in small groups? Do you want to just be in pairs? Um, again, UDL and differentiation, right? The more that we're giving kids options and asking them to reflect um, and letting them make decisions and choices, the more accessible our writing lessons will be. Okay, we're almost done. Um, homework is also super important. And sometimes you have power to give the kind of homework you want. Sometimes you don't. If you have that ability in your school, I really encourage you to think about choice boards. Lots of times choice boards where, right, there's nine things, please do one of them every night for homework. Pick whichever one you want, cross it off, come bring it into class the next day. Um, and this is another way where we're like engaging kids, we're giving them choice, but we're also giving them activities that pull in the skills that they've been learning um, in school, but using them in a way that feels natural, right? Like practicing your autograph or choosing any five words you want and writing a sentence for each one, right? Like that's fun. Um, writing five sentences about something that brings you joy or makes you happy. Um, we're Again, we're putting it back into the kids' lives where we're letting them tell stories about themselves. We're letting them make connections from the work, from the skills to their lives. And I'm gonna close out, again, I told you in the beginning, I wasn't gonna go through a lot of the foundational skills for teachers, but I do think it's really important for you to go through your curriculum and see what you know and don't know in terms of the parts of the English language that you are expected to teach. And then talk to the literacy experts and the SLPs, the speech and language pathologists in your school and get resources from them, right? It'll ensure that you're using the same language and visual supports from the curriculum when you're teaching. Um, like, of course, it's okay if you want to take courses over the summer about like the parts of speech in the English language. Um, but just remember that, not that it won't be called something different, but there might be like a phrase that's always used that's part of your curriculum um, that you'll have to then learn. Okay, we learned so many things um, in this last hour. 
Um, and I'm wondering, what are your action items? What are you excited to try out? Um, feel free to email me. And just remember to offer choices and connect learning to students' lives, right? Building connection and skills at the same time is like the, the best way that you can make your learning stick and make it accessible. Thanks, everyone.